our praise is, is, is an outpouring of our prayers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If your praise is weak, your prayer life is probably weak. If we talk about spirit and true. What did they do to Jesus? They flogged him and handed him over to be crucified. They whipped the Son of God. They whipped Jesus, God in the flesh. Here's the reality. The fact that Jesus kept his mouth shut, the fact that Jesus took the punishment of being flogged, the fact that Jesus went from courtroom to courtroom, the fact that Jesus allowed them to put a crown of thorns on his head, nails in his hands, spear in his side, nails in his feet, the fact that they, Jesus allowed them to do that demonstrates his love for all humanity. I said, should I go in there? What he was saying was, should I, a lay person, a non-priest, go up in that spot that the Bible tells me not to go into? Nehemiah knew that no true prophet would ask someone to violate God's law. Nehemiah knew that if he went up in there not being a priest, he could desecrate the temple and bring God's judgment on to himself. What does that mean? It means that you laugh. It means that you labor. It means that you cry with this body of believers to get this to this place. And so if you hear one thing, remember one thing about this message, I hope you know how important you are to God. Know that our church uh, is not a building, but a body, right? And, and that you never see it as these walls, right? But our worship that make us who we are. Amen? Because you may have heard different people in ministry talk about having a call uh, on their life or share uh, when they got the call or how they responded uh, to the call. Then you have people who ask the question, how do you know uh, when you have a call uh, on your life? Um, some people can feel that they missed their call. And they wonder if they're doing what God has really called them to do. Imagine their life should they have followed a different calling. And, and a few weeks ago, when we was out in, in Erie, PA, this passage that came to my heart and I shared it in a, in a, a brief, like five minute devotion. But while I was in it, uh, the Lord was kind of speaking and bringing this, this idea of call uh, back to mind. And then here, uh, ironically, several people have come to me and have communicated, you know, they believe God is calling them to something greater and unsure of what that call is. So I really wanted to get into this uh, passage and this idea of calling this morning. And so hopefully God will speak uh, to, through me to you to help clarify or identify the call and help confirm a call that may be on your life. And so if um, you go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 3, I believe that today you're going to learn at least three things. At least three things that we will learn to help us discern the call we have on our life. Exodus chapter Three. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Lord, and we could all be so many other places right now. But Lord, I pray that you speak in this place through me, online, wherever we may be, giving ear to your word that you would speak to us as only you can, that we would know that we are hearing your voice. Blot me out so that your children can hear from you. Have your way this morning in this service. Use me as your mouthpiece and we'll give you all the glory. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name. In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, it opens up in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, 
Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within the bush. As Moses looked, he saw the bush was on fire but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? Rule number one. And trying to discern your call, you have to make yourself available, right? The passage opens up and says, meanwhile, in some verses it says, now. It's, it's a way of showing us that something else was already happening when this passage began. And it tells us that God will interrupt our everyday natural lives for his supernatural presence, yeah, yeah. right? Moses was tending and doing what he do. His father-in-law sheep in a valley far away from Egypt where he grew up. Moses was raised in a, a privileged uh, environment. He benefited from the finest education in Egypt. He was raised by royalty, right? And then he had a great promise. It was like if you saw Moses, you're like, oh man, that boy, he's going to be something great. But now he finds himself in, in, in a desert, shepherding sheep, far away from where he was doing something nobody ever imagined he would be doing. And it's because he saw a Hebrew like himself being persecuted by an Egyptian. And he went over and he killed that Egyptian. And, and when he killed that Egyptian, it caused him to flee for his life. And that's where we find him now out in the desert, shepherding sheep. 40 years after he'd done this deed, he was still dealing with the repercussions of his actions. But God. That's that but God. Say, say but God. See, but God is always at work, right? Whether or not we see it or not, Moses was, was unaware that, that God was more upset than he was about how the Egyptians was treating the Israelites, right? And, and God had a plan to deliver them. In other words, God wanted to do something through Moses, even though Moses was already doing something, all right? Moses is caring for the sheep. He's feeding them. He has this divine interruption of life. Anybody who has a call in their life can point back to a divine interruption. Yeah. When God just broke through everything and spoke to them. And, and this is one of those moments where it says the angel of the Lord spoke to him through this bush uh, in the fire, right? And in and, and the world, you know, th this, this would naturally just wreck his world because he see this fire, he see this bush, he see it burning up, he's tending to these sheep. Moses cares about the sheep, so he don't want them to go near this fire because he wanted to keep them from harm and he wanted to keep them from danger because they actually eat the grass. And, and it was a sight so strange that Moses had to be willing to stop what he was doing to go and investigate, right? Yeah. And, and this is important for us to see because huh, so often I believe God interrupts our life. I believe he breaks in to our natural. And I believe we miss it because we never stop to actually investigate. We never stop to acknowledge his presence. We are so busy yeah. with life. Yeah. I was in the car the other day and I'm riding and the car just came zooming from, from my left. When I'm about to turn, ran through the light, almost smacked and I'm like, oh. And the, and the thing about it just happened, I normally, and, and, and Kim will tell you, light turns green, I'm out. That's just the way I drive. And if you're not out, you will hear my horn to let you know the light turns green, it's time to be out. So my normal tendency is always light turns green, I'm out. Can be looking down or something like green? Like, like I'm like, if, if I'm riding with you, I'm like, you know, it's green. Like, it's, it's time to go. That's me. But yet, light turns green, and for whatever reason, I don't move. Right? Car come flying through. And I, I knew immediately, it wasn't for whatever reason, God had interrupted, right? Put me on pause, let this car go past. So immediately I started worshiping. Because I knew, nah, I wasn't looking at my phone, I went, but something just made me not move. That something.
it was God speaking, saying, pause for a second. There's no rush here. I didn't hear it audibly, but in my spirit, something just said free. And I did. Those moments, many of them be like, ooh, that was close, and keep going. <laughs> Take off and boom, put your music on, never stop to understand God just interrupted my world for, for, for my protection. We miss moments like that. I believe happen all the time. It's impossible to discern a call if you don't make yourself available to the one that's calling. We, we got to be willing to stop and give God our undivided attention. And being available doesn't mean start with us doing something. It starts with us first being. It starts first with us, us having a relationship with the Lord. God went to Moses' job. Right? He went to Moses' job. He went to where he, he worked and he just interrupted and he introduced himself to Moses in a way that he knew would draw Moses in. You know, if we want to know what we were created for, we have to go talk to the one who created us. Right? And, and it, it may sound simple, but, but for most of us who may feel we have a call in our life, I'm going to tell you, many times, most people put off that call and they never make themselves available for that call because they know with that call comes a cost. Right? Like you can know God has something for me. God wants me to do something. I really believe that, that, that if I really surrender to God, somebody is really going to be blessed. Something is really going to change and God is going to be glorified. Like God will let you know that. And then you got to listen or look it off. I'm going to tell you, I believe 90% of Christians look it off. And I'm going to tell you, the reason they do it is because of time. Folks say, I ain't got time. They won't say it out loud. But in their spirit, I ain't got time to do this, Lord. I ain't got time to, to, to listen. I ain't got time to, to follow this call. I'm, I'm too busy. I ain't even got time for myself. Have you ever said that? That you're so busy, you don't even have time for yourself? I mean, I've heard, I ain't got time to get my hair done, I ain't got time to get my nails done. I ain't saying that, Miles, I'm just saying I heard. I heard this being said, I ain't got time. Right? I ain't got time to go to, go to the store to get the stuff I need. Not get the stuff we want. I ain't got time to stop past the store to get the stuff we need. I heard somebody say, I, oh, I, did you eat? No, why? I ain't had time. <laughs> I ain't got time to eat. I ain't got time. I ain't get no time to sleep. So if I ain't got time to eat and sleep, God, you think I got extra time for you? I think some of us are so caught up in the matrix of life that we don't actually have a life. Yeah. You know, one of the things I love about The Matrix, how many of us have seen The Matrix? Yeah. Matrix is a deep movie. And The Matrix is this guy named Neo. He knows something's not right. They offer him two pills. There's a blue pill and a red pill. You take this one pill, you unplug from the hamster wheel of life. And you get to see things for what they are. You take the other pill and ignorance is bliss. You just keep on doing what you're doing. Most of us get a choice just like that. And yet we take the one that keep us ignorant and running on the wheel over and over and over and over again. We eat stuff we know gonna kill us, but we still eat because we don't wanna shop and we don't wanna diet and we don't wanna change. 
so we continue to do it, knowing it's going to do us wrong. They say, hey, just work out 30 minutes a day and you will live longer. We all want to live as long as we can, but our treadmills become coke racks. <laughs> we can know that sleep is important and sleep deprivation can lead to heart disease, but what we do? I ain't got time to sleep. And so we choose ignorance. We choose this, this idea that I'm going to stay plugged in to this matrix of life as if we were so busy doing something that actually I'm not saying you're not doing nothing important because but what I'm saying is you ain't curing cancer. You ain't eradicating poverty. You, 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 you're not, you know, changing. Uh, and you're, not, you're not even making millions of dollars and you're working. So like, like, but boy, are you tired. And the truth is, even if you were doing any of these things, the word still says, seek me first, my kingdom, and my righteousness, right? And I believe if we actually put God first, we would experience this, this the peace of God, and, and we would lay our burdens down and be able to spend to, 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 to share on the rest of God. Like this, this idea of, of shalom. You know, that we're, we're desperately missing in our everyday lives is because we think we don't have time when the truth is if we actually spent our time the right way, yeah. we would have a totally different income, Amen. totally different outcome. So, so Moses stopped working so he could fix his eyes on the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. So first he made himself available. And then next... He answered the call. Look at verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It says Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Yeah. God called him from the bush and Moses said, here I am. He, he answered. I, I love the fact that God didn't shout. He didn't break open the ceiling. He didn't hit him with a lightning bolt. He, he didn't. He just waited till he got close enough yeah. to hear him. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. That's good. James says in, in chapter 4 verses 8 that he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Some of us can hear from God because we won't turn down the busyness. We don't turn down the music. We don't turn down life. We can't sit in quiet. TV got to be on. Radio got to be on. Uh, uh, social media got to be on. Like We don't know how to be quiet. We don't know how to be still and know that he is God. We have to be doing something. Our minds have to constantly be running 24-7 and then we're asking, where is God? Why don't I ever hear from him? You're never quiet long enough to hear from him. I'm trying to talk, but your TV is too loud. God spoke to Moses from this bush. And, and it's intimate because he, he calls Moses by name. This is Jehovah, this is Yahweh, this is the Alpha and Omega, this is the omnipotent God who knows our name and desires to have a relationship with us and include us in his plan. And so he calls us, he knows us. Jeremiah 1 and 5, God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He says, before you were born, I set you apart. Paul said, God set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. And, and so when Moses goes over, Moses recognizes it's God making the call. God identifies himself as, as the God of his father and his ancestors. 
And, and we need to know who's calling. Mm -hmm. Amen. Most of us, when we get a call, what do we do? <laughs> we look at the phone and see who it is. How many of us that's, that's had a phone on just hit answer no matter what? Huh? We, we look down. We want to know who called, and then we, we look down and we want to see who called. And then we want to discern what kind of call is it? Like, what, how long? Like, we look like, ooh, like, can I really take that call right now? Even if we like them, how long? Will the conversation take? Because I'm busy, right? I ain't really got time to take this call right now. You know, you don't want to who they call you and you decide to text them when they call you. Who the, huh? I, I'm going to respond, but I'm going to text instead of call. I'm going to just, you know, because I can do that. That's efficient. Because I'm actually texting five other people at the same time. Why? Because I'm so busy, right? So Moses recognize that it was God calling and, and when, you know, and I'm gonna, this call that we have, all of us as believers mm -hmm. have a call on our life, mm -hmm. right? We have a universal call, yeah, yeah. right? The priesthood of believers call, yeah. right? If you look at 1 Peter 2 and 9, it kind of communicates that we are this chosen people, this royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that we are called to declare the praises of him, right, who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. This means as, as believers, right, we all have been chosen and set apart by God and for God. We all have a call in our life to declare his praises, right, because he's delivered us out of darkness. The universal call of the priesthood of believers had nothing to do when, when, when you having a job in a secular world or you having a job in a church, we are all called to be full-time Christians. Amen. Amen. Did you know that? Yes. I want to stop here. Full-time Christians. Regardless of how you earn a living, yeah. you're called to be a full-time Christian. This, this is missed because when Christians talk about full time, they only think there's one person that's full time. That's pastor. Pastor full time. The rest of us part time Christians. But he full time. He in that fishbowl every minute, every day of his life. But me on Sunday, and if I come to small group, because the rest of the time I'm so busy. Huh? So you don't have that call on your life. It's me that got it on my life. That's, that's what we think. And as a candidate, you might be a three-quarter. <laughs> uh -huh. The rest of the ministry, they get y'all half. Y'all half time. Right? And y'all work one day a week. That's, I'm, I'm serious, though. That's the idea that, yeah, if I do it well, I ain't cussing on Sunday. It's Sunday. You can't be cussing. <laughs> Okay, because you're going to lie on Sunday. I can't tell you how many times I heard somebody like, oh, and you in the church. But if you get outside, it's all good. If you can just make it to the door, you can lie as much as you want, cuss as much as you want, do whatever. But you in church. Right? Not you a Christian, you in church. Like, no. We don't do that here. Right? <laughs> got to understand that as believers, Christ is meant to rule and reign in every area of our life, right? It's not about our job. I can be an entrepreneur, but I should have integrity. I should treat my workers with love and, and with respect. I do my taxes, right? I earn my God in the way I own my business, right? I, I, I can be a, a politician, but the, the policies, right, that I go and, and, and the bills that, that, that I support, they go with my faith. I can work in retail and I'm the, the nice guy in the store. You ever see the one nice person? You're trying to get that one person, right? I don't care what store you in. It's just nastiness. I'm like, how did you get in customer service when you don't like serving customers? 
Why do I come to your job and feel like I'm bothering you and you getting paid to serve me? Right? It bugs me out, but sometimes it's, it's one person. Right? That's nice. One person, can I help you? One person, thank you. Right? And I'm like, I want to go to them. No, no, no. I'll wait. I, I'm like, you can go in front of me. I want them. Right? And that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the them. Despite all the darkness that surrounds us, we're the them. We're the one light that people are supposed to see when they come in there. No matter what job you're at. Because you're a full-time Christian. That you behave in a way that somebody want to ask, why are you different? than everybody else that works in here. Some are, are, are called to exercise their faith in the marketplace, right? Where we work. Some of us are called to be bivocational. Like Paul. Paul made tents, but he also preached, right? And he was a church planner, right? So he had a call in the church but he also had a regular job that afforded him an income so that he can serve, right? Then you have those who are compensated fully by the kingdom. And that could be pastors, that could be Christian counselors, that could be uh, uh, missionaries, anybody who all they do is work for the Lord, right? But we're all full-time Christians. Regardless of any of those things, so, so it's critical for us to discern the direction of the call. Yeah. And then we got to learn how to be patient yeah. for the details, yeah. right? Because yeah. we want to know everything up front. Let me tell you. Yeah. Talk about it. Right? When God called me, I did not know in what capacity I would be serving him. But I did know that I would need education. Right? I, I, I did know that I would be needing to be equipped for whatever it was that he was calling me to. I had got called, I had read the Bible, I read from Genesis to Revelation. And after I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I, I went to kill him and I said, hey, I, I read all of this, but, but I think there's something else that, that God is saying or wants to say to me and through me and I'm I got some questions, and I'm not understanding all of the answers, and, and we're going back and forth and all of this stuff. And she says, uh, well, go talk to my pastor at that time, right? And I went and I talked to him, and I was sharing some of the things I was wrestling with, and he told me about, you know, Karen, PBU. He said, you, need, you do need to go to school. And so I went to school, and, and after I went to school, I went to seminary, and then I learned that I don't just need this formal education, I need a pastor. I need a mentor, I need a disciple. That's where Pastor Hopkins came into my life. And, and I resigned from the record label where I was at, where I was the CEO, I enrolled in school, I searched for a church, I searched for a pastor, and all those things came together, but I had no clue when God called me that I would be pastoring Great Commission Church. God didn't call me and say, hey, I got this church. I'm calling you now. Here's this church that you know. I had no clue that I was going to be a professor. I had no clue I was going to be an author or be a director of church. Oh, I'm glad. I didn't know all of that in the beginning when he called me, right? All I know is he called me and, and I answered. All I know is I, I fell in love with Jesus and I was like, now what? Now, now, what do you want me to do? And it was like, prepare yourself. How do I prepare myself? I had to get closer to him, right? Which means I had to study. I had to pray. I had to make myself available. I had to answer the call because I had stopped doing the other things that was keeping me from him. Yeah, yeah. When, when we say yes to the call, it's not about a position. It's about our submission. Right? You know, it's not, oh yeah, it's not you get saved there. You're like, oh, the Lord called me to pass it. Oh, you just got saved. And you say that to anybody, you're like, man, I just want you to put the 40 down. You know what I mean? Like, I just, like you can't just, you know, go from here to there. That's a process. Right? And, and, and so you don't got saved to the position, you got saved to submission. Right? And so, so you get the call and you start wrestling with that call. Right? As, as God begins to try to help you understand what's next for you. Right? But walking by faith, not by sight, is the answering 
of the call. When you see Abraham's name in the Hebrew 11 Hall of Faith, what we call it, well, it's in there because God called him and sent him to a place. And the reason he's in there is because he answered, responded, and went, not knowing where he was actually going. Yeah, yeah, that's good. He just was following the voice of God, right? God rarely gives you all the details when he calls you. But our posture of acceptance is so important. When God, uh, 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 when Moses heard God introduce himself to him as the God of his father and as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, he was overwhelmed. The pastor said he covered his face. He, he had realized he had just seen the holiness of God. And, and he dare felt worthy to lay eye on God because he had reverence for him, right? He, he knew who he was, but, but for some of us, we see the calling of God more as a more as a problem than a privilege. Yeah, yeah. More, more as a burden Talk about than a blessing. But I tell you, there's no better boss and no greater call yeah, yeah. than to have God desire to include you in his plan. You, you scared to clap because you scared to be included. Uh. <laughs> you scared. You sitting there listening right now like, Lord, are you talking to me? I know what you're doing. Lord, what, what, what are you saying? Right? See, and the Lord is saying, you can't say, love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And then ignore, dismiss, and deny Making yourselves available for the call. That's a good word. So we make ourselves available by stopping long enough to see and hear from the Lord. We answer the call by submitting to the Lord and saying, have your way. And then finally, we'll get our appointment for the Lord. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. And I heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land mm -hmm. to a good and spacious land. Yeah, yeah. A land full with milk and honey. The territory of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. So because the Israelites cried for help has come to me, and I've also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Once Moses made himself available when he answered the call, mm -hmm. he get the assignment portion. Now, listen, Moses, mm -hmm. he wanted to see his people delivered as well. So this call on Moses' life was consistent with Moses' heart, right? Mm -hmm. And in addition, Moses had experience being on both sides of the fence. He was on the Egypt side at one point. He was on the Israel side at one point, right? And he was being called to go back to a place that was familiar and to do something that would bring God glory. Amen? Yeah. So what's wrong with God? Right? Sound, sound good, but y'all getting real quiet now. <laughs> Where do I fit in out here? Right? So, so, listen, God can call you and send you to a distant land uh, and, and to people you don't know, never heard of, who speak a language you don't know. And he, he can do that because he got it. He can do whatever he want, right? But nine times out of ten, the Bible shows over and over and over again God calls us and he uniquely gifts us and he'll allow us to have certain experiences that will help prepare us with his empowering, right, to do what he's calling us to do. When you look at the Bible, look at Joseph in Egypt, look at Daniel in Babylon, look at Gideon in Manasseh, look at, look at Esther and Susa. The Bible is replete with examples, right? Of, of God using people in 
and experiences to bring him glory. So the very place and the person that Moses was running from, God decides to send him back to. You have experienced and been delivered through some things. Just so you can be an advocate and help deliver others through the same things that you have experienced. Amen. Amen. I never wanted, asked for, requested, or prayed for cancer. But God, let me get it not once, but twice. Twice. And I could have got mad and said, why are you punishing me? But God used that to bring greater attention. He knew I was going to speak about it and not curl up in a ball and die about it. And I spoke out about it, right? I did a documentary about it. I preached about it. I lived transparently while I was going through it. And can I tell you how many men I have talked to since then, 2018 and 2020, who actually say to me, dude, I think you saved my life by going public with what you were going through. Because I never wanted to get checked. So I ran from it as long as I could. Different ones discovered they had it. The Lord has used it as a ministry as I walk people through the valley as they go through it. But if you would have asked me, hey, this is going to be a great tool for ministry. You want a dose of cancer? Like, no! No! There got to be somebody else you can get at, too. I'm doing this other stuff for you. But, but understand, God will use our toughest, most painful points of life to comfort another one of his children. The problem is sometimes we're so quiet about those painful things. We're embarrassed mm. yeah. about those painful moments. So we let the trials and the tribulations and the sins that we've been delivered from go unspoken, hoping that nobody ever finds out about what we've been through yeah. when the truth is God want, to help, want you to help somebody else get through. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't know Moses' story, although he answered God, he did go back and forth with him. Right? Moses did not think he was worthy of this call or capable to fulfill the calling he had on his life. Moses was a murderer. Y'all know that, right? He was a fugitive, right? He ran, right? He had some kind of speech impediment. We don't know. But whatever it was, he felt it would disqualify him from the call he had on his life. But God said to Moses, isn't that I who made the mouth? I will give you the ability to speak, right? The Bible clearly teaches us if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. This means our past does not disqualify us from our call. Yeah. Right? Are all, did y'all hear me? Yeah. Your past does not disqualify And the reason y'all need to hear that because I know some of y'all are scared to step up because you think somebody's going to find out what you used to do, who you used to be, where you used to go, how you used to live. And so you're like, no, God, God can't use me. And I say, you must not have read that David was an adulterer, that Abraham was also a liar, that Rahab was a prostitute, that Paul persecuted Christians, that Jacob was a, a cheater, like every person yes. in the Bible yes. had sin yes. and God still delivered and used them. Yes. All of these people could have easily looked at their past and said there's no way God is calling me. I said it. But can I tell you the devil is a liar. He's the father 
of, of, of lies. The devil wants to, to silence you, right? Yeah. He wants nothing more than to keep you in bondage, right? Because of your past in order to restrain you from your future. Listen, your past can't disqualify you from your call. But your present can. Here's where it gets tricky. See, because just like God wants you to accept the call, Satan wants you to miss the call. You got to know, spiritual warfare is real. right? There's more to this life than us humans just hanging around in it. There's a spiritual world that we don't see, and because we don't see it, we just ignore it and act like it don't exist. But it's real. And just like God is calling you, the enemy is trying to stop you. The moment Eve got called, the moment Eve was there, what did Satan do? He stopped paying like, did God really say that? Right? So the moment you start wrestling with this call on your life, Satan is speaking to you like, hey, you ain't got no call. He ain't talking to you. This is a good time to nap. <laughs> you're getting sleepy. You're getting sleepy. You're getting. The enemy wants you to cock out. The enemy wants you to say, How long is this? Oh, the Eagles don't play today. Ah, it got to be something else. I can focus in on besides this man up there yelling at me about a car. It got to be something. That's what Satan is doing. Satan is trying to pull you away from what God is trying to pull you to. And if he can get you to doubt and question the call, you won't have to answer the call. Right? Understand, when Jesus was just about to begin his ministry, Satan gripped him up and said, come on, let's go for a walk. And the same three temptations that he did for Jesus is what he do to us. He tempted us with what? He tempted us with lust of the flesh. He tried to tempt you to have this, this lust Right? To self-please. Right? If I can get you to please yourself, right? I can disqualify you for what I got for you. Right? You got, you got lust of the eyes that tempt you with, with money, tempt you with possessions, tempt you with overtime, tempt you with materialisms. You can't serve God and money. Right? Which one are you going to choose? Oh, I got to work tomorrow. Pride of life. And this me and my world, just put yourself first. Let's just seek God first. Really? Come on. Seek me first and my righteousness. Not thee first. Seek me first. Right? And if you can put yourself first, God will never fit in that equation because you are in need so much. You have an appetite that can never be satisfied. So the moment you decide to put you first, there is really no room for God. We don't realize that, but the Satan knew it, and he got the same tricks 2,000 years later. That's why the Bible says you have to deny yourself every day. You got to die to self every day. You got to put on the armor every day, right? Because if you don't, you will put you first. And as long as you come first, God just don't fit in your world. His game plan doesn't change. Listen, I'm done. <laughs> God saved you. God saved you. God got a plan for your life. Yeah. God doesn't save people just so you can have a good life or get to heaven. Yeah. Regardless of what you think. Right. He didn't save you so you can get to heaven. Right. He saved you to bring him glory. Yeah. He didn't save you so you wouldn't have problems. He saved you to tell his story. Like He didn't save you so you can be comfortable. That wasn't it. He didn't save you so you could come to church. He saved you so that you could lift him up so he could draw all men unto him. And so if you've been saved, you got a calling. And if you got a calling, you got to ask yourself, am I going to pick it up? Or am I going to just let it ring? Father, your grace is so sufficient. Forgive us for pushing the ignore so many times. 
when you've called. Some of you just want to rescue us from our way of life. Take us out of darkness and bring us into the light. You went to a cross to die that we may live. You took our sins upon you to give us life and to have it more abundantly. If you're here in the under the sound of my voice, if you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your opportunity. Right where you are, just put your hand up and put it back down and we'll pray for you. We'll talk to you about what it looks like to have a relationship with the Lord. What it looks like to lead the old way of life and, and come into this new relationship with the Lord. Just put your hand up and put it back down. If you're online, we invite you into a relationship with the Lord. You can simply repeat after me. I'm a sinner. I believe Christ died for my sins. I believe he rose again. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my life and change my life for the rest of my life. If you're here and you know or you're wrestling with knowing whether or not you have a call on your life or what that call may be, get up. I want to invite you out to see to come down to the front. I want to have a moment of prayer. Just come on down to the front if you're wrestling with the call in your life. Let's come up here. You're trying to figure out what it is that God is calling you to do. You're trying to discern what that call is. You know you've been wrestling. You know you hear a voice. You know you hear some urging. You don't know what that is, but you're ready to submit. church who, Lord, you're speaking to, Lord, who you have called to something greater, Lord. And even as we look at your word, Father, we understand, Lord, how we, we live the natural lives. And Father, you interrupt our natural lives as you did with Moses, Lord. And there's a, a burning bush moment. There's a moment of clarity where you speak to us and you call us to something greater, to something that's kingdom to something that's beyond ourselves, to something we don't have the strength to do, something that, that's close to our heart, Lord God, and, and we know that you have positioned us for it, Father. So, God, I, I just pray for those who are here, Lord, who are in the midst of that, that burning bush moment, Father God. You've called them to something. And at the same time that we're called, Lord God, there are struggles that we have because we look at ourselves, God, and we see that, that we are uh, individuals with unclean lips, that we're not worthy in and of ourselves to do what you called us to do, Father God. In and of ourselves, but with Jesus and with, with you, Lord God, you, you make us worthy. You make us available. You set us aside to the call that you've placed in our lives, Father God. And we're thankful for that. But if we're honest, Lord, so many up here struggle with the fear of moving beyond, Lord, stepping into what you've called us to do, Lord, because we, we, we pay attention to so much noise. We're so busy with the things of life, hearing the things of this world calling, distracting us from what you've called us to, Lord God. We pray for victory in that area. Lord, attune our minds and our hearts, Lord, to your voice. Lord, turn down the distractions of this world. Turn down the distractions of our minds and our hearts, of our past, the past sins, those things we, we've done, we believe that we can never be forgiven of, where you've paid the price on Calvary's cross, God. Help us to walk in victory and completeness and shalom, Lord God, so that we might step out into what you've called us to do. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, I pray for those who are here, Lord God. 
You set us on a course, Lord God. I pray that we would remain available to the call that you've placed in our lives, Lord God. And that we would walk by faith into the unknown, Lord. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know all the details of the call that you have in our lives, Father God. But you know and we trust you. That you're almighty, Lord God. That you hold all things in your hand. That you hold all things together. That everything that is, is sustained by the word of your power. And so we trust you with the future, Lord God. With the unknown, Lord God. But we want to be obedient right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We want to sacrifice, sacrifice right now in the name of Jesus. We don't want to live our life in regret, missing out on the opportunity that's presented to be about your kingdom and your work in the world. So God, I pray that you would set aside hearts this morning. Lord, that you would tear down the walls that we build up against your will, that you would tear down the disobedience, that you would tear down, Lord, the distractions of this world and this life, that we would say, like, like Moses, Lord God, like Isaiah, here am I. Send me. If there's a mission, I want to be on that. God, stir our hearts. Fan the flame. Lord, don't allow this world and the affections of this world to snuff out the call that you have in our lives. Lord, empower us. Use us. Fill us with your spirit to do your work. God, we want to bring you glory this morning. We want to bring you honor this morning, Father God. God, when this life is over, we want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Not woulda, coulda, shoulda, but well done. God, we need that. We want that. So God, I pray over those who, who feel called, Lord God, and understand the call in your life, their lives, Father God. Help them to understand that you got it. You got the details, Lord. Help them understand there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ that is in Christ Jesus. Love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Helps to know that we are all called, Lord God. Don't let us sleep. Don't let us feel peace, Lord, and disobedience. But stir us, Father God. We need you. We thank you for what you're going to do in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.